How about if I unmute and how about if I turn on my video? There we are. I bet you, you know what? Uh, third time's a charm kind of thing. How are you? We're going to get all our technology dialed in the right way today. Is my camera coming up? Not yet. Okay. You know, I was down in Tennessee a couple of weeks ago and I, I heard that. I guess it's Amazon bought hundreds of acres not far from you off I-40. Yep. Everybody wants to be here. Texas, Tennessee, yeah, Florida. It no just pack. kind of screwed up the pricing of uh, horse property in Tennessee on me. <laughs> I bet it did. <laughs> uh, I bet it did. Yeah, you're laughing. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I've watched our property here go up, uh, I don't know, 25% in a short period of time. It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. The trouble is, you got New Yorkers and California people moving in, and people from Chicago. I mean, you're I know, they're I good the neighborhood. Them, I hate to tell them where I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> but you married well. At least you married a Penn Stater. That's right. You know. But uh, I still do not have your video. Why not? I don't know. Well, let me turn it on again. All it says is Gary Bender. Uh, the camera's on. It was on when I had it blank. So down in the bottom left where it says video or stop video and all that, that little up arrow. Can't see me now, huh? Mm -mm. What does it say next when you do that little up arrow by the stop video button by the mic? Well, it's got a red line across it. It says, "Be you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. So you're blocking me. Okay, let me, okay, let me check. And you, you're going to pull up the screen and share the files, right? Or am I going to do that? I can do it either way. Yeah, okay, you do it. And then, I, then you just give me the co-pilot stick. Okay. I'm working on it here. Let's see. I didn't realize you had a little intelligence agency background. Yeah, I was a Russian intelligence analyst. Big Russian. Okay. I'm allowed, I allowed you to start video. Yeah, yeah, go for you, Poroski. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'll be able to which means I was a uh, spy or intel analyst guy. Yeah. Yeah. My son spent. Seven or eight years of his life doing that. Too. There we go. Hey, how's that? Good to see you. So you were a civilian. <laughs> I was. Um, I was military when I did. Oh, okay, so that's the NSA. Folds of Honor shirt. Yep. So we just kicked off the scholarship program for 2022. We just expanded the offerings uh, to include master's degree and doctoral degrees. So awesome. got to raise. Got to raise more money. Oh, there you go. It's a professional begathon. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Good cause. Yeah. It is. My camera is not incredibly clear. I don't, I'm, I'm not hung over or anything, but I, I don't think the video is. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to use slides anyway. Mm -hmm. So let me turn off my phone. I had a good conversation with one or two of your clients clients. Um, oh. Gosh, I'm going to say a guy in Texas whose name I have somewhere and um, and then the guy out in California. 
out in um, Orange County. Yeah, I, met, I just met with that gentleman again. You can't remember his name either, huh? <laughs> uh, Don. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. I, I actually, I believe I mailed him a copy of the book. Well, that's nice of you. And I'm a good guy. I've got three more to mail out um, to some people I've met that do cost expense reduction, but they don't, they don't understand healthcare. Right. And that's right. the biggest, that's the biggest ox to be gored. It totally is. Yeah. We, uh, we have one that's, I think they have about 500 employees. We just delivered $2 million in better benefits, $2 million reduction. In one year? In one year, first year. Yeah. It's huge. And huge. they're with, you know, I, I could rattle it off. They're with a big ABC house agency, but they didn't realize their whole revenue model is based on profit sharing with the insurer. And that's where their interests are. Well, if we ever want to do a case study and pop it up here, we ought to do that. Yeah, I just had three of them put together, in fact. Good. We'll send them over. Yeah, I'll share them with you. Then we need to figure out when we're going to do that as a topic for this. Yeah. Exact summary. Okay. Yeah, maybe in the next couple, maybe two, three months or something. Yeah. I was thinking about doing one where we basically said, how do you even understand your bill? You even know what you're paying for healthcare and literally just do a, a little case on, hey, your renewal is going to be up 8% for $5 million. You actually came in at five and a half million. And then my guess is your broker never told you that. And um, do you even know what you spent the five and a half million on? And then we're going to tell you your PEPY is like $17,000 and best in class is nine. So would you like to move from 17 to nine? And here's how to do it. And just take a real case. Right, exactly. You got one of those in the can, we can turn it into slides. Yeah, I do. That a boy. Well, um, we might well give maybe one or two more minutes. Okay. We got them all streaming in now. In our, in our COVID world, everybody's working from home, zooming yeah. all day. Yeah. I'll share a little comic relief with everyone. I'll see if you can read this. This note came home with my four-year-old. Okay. <laughs> uh, he will keep his private or unless he is in the bathroom. <laughs> they address it to you or your wife? Mr. and Mrs. Seeger. <laughs> keep so that I've been, one. I've been keeping that, yeah. I, I remind my son with his report card from third grade where he failed math and his report card from eighth grade when he failed basic IT programming. And he reminds me he graduated top in his class and his master's degree in applied mathematics at MIT. And then, I'll, then, I'll, then, I'll, then has three patents in IT. Is there so much for those who can do work and those who do teach? Right, right. So, but he he literally got put in remedial math in third grade. Yeah, right, right. I believe it. I believe it. And his short answer was, "We'll show your work." You really, you can't figure this out in your head. That was the third grader <laughs> to a to a forty five year old teacher. Really, you have to show this. This is like that's great. That's how did great. everybody else take half an hour to answer twenty questions in two minutes? I was done. And what do you mean, show your work? It's obvious. He was struggling with boredom. Yeah, they didn't do well. Well, why don't we kick it off? Let's uh, kick it off. I think you'll be able to share. If not, I can easily pull up the stuff too. But okay. uh, then you, you know, we might be more efficient that way because you'll be able to click along as you want. Yeah, I'm going to fly uh, through the first four slides. Okay. So, and let them know about the little bit of a, how you're going to push one of the topics forward and all that. But yeah. if you haven't been on with us before, I'm Paul Siegert. You've got Gary Bender here. And we decided to put together a virtual CFO forum. Gary has been one of the best minds for me to get access to in terms of understanding how CFOs think. And maybe since we're still kind of in the beginning of forming this group, Gary, when I turn it over to you, if you can't, don't mind taking a minute to share a little bit about your background and what you've done and, and why you decided to do this. Sure. Uh, our goal is to bring value in every way that we can to all of you and uh, create some sort of a community here where we share best practices and save each other time to get better results. So I'm excited to uh, 
to bring Gary to you all and spend a, a little bit of time together once a month uh, sharing and delivering value. So Gary, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Paul. Good to see you again. And good to have our technology working for the first time this month. Uh, <laughs> folks, uh, my name is Gary Bender. I'm uh, the CFO of an engineering firm in Manhattan. We actually uh, work on little buildings like the Freedom Tower. So we do skyscraper engineering. But eight years ago, uh, in my third or fourth stint as a private company serial CFO, I was asked to start sharing best practices, which I thought was very humbling. And we put together a group of CFOs and, and, and started to build out a way to share best practices, best processes, and it quickly grew into adding better partners to work with. So we created the CFO solution eight years ago, and we've done 75 to 100 working meetings that are typically two to three hours long, where 40, 30, 40, 50 CFOs get together and we just beat a problem to death and share best practices. And it always comes up as, well, who would you recommend I work with? Paul's one of the guys we recommend you work with in healthcare. We've got over 190 other Paul, Fred, and Joe's out there that are subject matter experts. We call them partners. And when I met Paul probably four or five years ago, we talked about, hey, I don't understand. Paul, I'll pick on you a little bit here. I don't understand this two, three hours of what you guys talk about. Can you, can you summarize it? So what we're going to do today and as the other sections, we're going to spend 25 minutes going 100 miles an hour to, to overview a topic. And we're gonna do it at 100 miles an hour off these slides because what Paul has arranged to do is to give you all access through PCS Advisors Portal off his website or just come to our website and you'll see the info in the slides. And, and you can see not only today's slides in this recording, but you can have access to all of the, all of the uh, and I'll do the air quotes thing, all the great stuff that we have shared among our, our group here in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, with you folks. So we're, we're effectively giving you a table of contents and an index of the best practices among your peers. We, we don't have all the answers. We, we share awareness. We share good, good and bad, what to do and what you don't want to do, and let you be the judge of it. And then finally, if, if you want to know more, you can surf around our website. You'll see everything we've done. It's getting a little more organized each month, to be honest, to do it on a Zoom basis. And then you can always pick up the phone or shoot me an email and, and ask me a bit more. And after I exhaust my knowledge in five minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll offer to introduce you to somebody a lot smarter than me who actually helped us share the best practice. So with that, today, we're going to, the first half hour, we're going to talk about the state of the world in recruiting employees and some best practices and what's actually what's changed in, in the last year or two, courtesy of COVID. In the second half hour, we're gonna, we're gonna change from our agenda. And I apologize, but I, I'm responding to, to the comments I got from some of you folks. Back in December, we talked about reducing costs using contingency experts, kind of the expense reduction guys that call you all the time. And some of you disagreed. Most of you wanted to know more that it is, is it really true? So I've added a second half hour and giving you some examples on that. And the topic we were gonna discuss was, was how to manage your real estate leases uh, strategically. We'll, we'll have that at a future event. If you signed on for that, shoot me a note. You can yell at me a bit and I'll send you the deck. So I could, we'll try to cover three things in the time of two today. So Paul, let's bring up the first deck um, on human capital and I'll we'll start talking through that. All right. And, and to those who are new to the group, let me pull up a share. Thank you. Share screen. Um, to those of you who are new to the group. Are you sharing or do you want me? You're going to share. Go ahead and see if you can get it up here. And then I'll, yeah. I've got it queued up if we need it. You got it there? Okay. Okay. So let me just get going here, folks. Um, Okay, and Paul, I'll tell you what, let's you hit the you hit the page buttons because I've got two screens going here. Okay, so, so go so ahead. Let's, and, jump, uh, let's jump right to page five, which talks about the agenda, and then we'll get going. So go to pop five, the human capital agenda. Yeah, here we go. I'm going to take over the screen share, and we're going to. There we go. 
Okay, go right, right to page five. Let me hit go here and then we'll start clicking through. Okay, so human capital agenda. What is going on out there and what are the best practices? And I want you to think of this two ways. About, about a third of the CFOs we talk to officially have HR responsibility. Another third feel they're held accountable when, when something's not working in HR, either cost or attendance or shortages or laying off people somehow becomes, quote, our problem. And then in, in other cases, you do have a peer executive in charge of HR. So in this case, what I'm talking about today, feel free to share you know, with, with the CEO, and with the HR exec and the management team. Let's, let's talk about the next slide. We, and by the way, this is backed up by a 50 slide deck that we had one of the top HR consulting firms visit with our group uh, literally six weeks ago and staggered us with her findings, all supported by data, contemporary information. So if you're interested in that, I have put that 50 page, two hour working presentation up so you can read the details. And I really encourage you to do because I'm taking a shortcut here. So let's look at the next slide. We talked about the great resignation, the COVID resignation, and it's just the, the dilemma that none of us can understand. Millions of unfilled positions in the United States, every level of job, we all know that full-time, part-time, we're all struggling, but yet unemployment's only 4%. And we all remember the classes, that means people are not in the workforce looking. So they they've either have they permanently retired, are they waiting for the mandates to come off or just what is going on? So the world's changed and, and I contend and, and, and the, the, the expert speaker we had is, she contended the world has changed but most companies have not changed their practices. So here we are, definition of insanity as it relates to hiring people and retaining people of, well, we'll just keep what we're doing, what we've been doing for 10 or 20 years and is that gonna keep working? Well, let's go through the top 10, the, the, uh, the Letterman style of the top 10 trends. And, and these, this is all backed up by data. For each one of these bullet points, there's a page that gets into the gory detail. But again, I'm doing, going 100 miles an hour. Number one on recruiting or retaining is employee well-being. I don't personally believe it, but employee well-being is as important, if not more important, than the compensation. People are changing jobs, leaving jobs for their well-being. It's defined by you know, are the benefits what, what support my lifestyle and expectations? Is the compensation adequate and is it fair? And um, does the does the do the values of the employer meet the value requirements of the employee? If not, I will move. So point number one, employee well-being is, is all that people are talking about. Number two, the benefits are critical. Number three, not surprising, but I'm surprised it's that hard. 83% of employees in the last year prefer hybrid work. A lot of them are not going to come back to the office and they'll change jobs because of it. Value match, in other words, the the company's culture, the company's value, the mission statement and how they execute is, is important to 75% of employees, but really important to employees under 40 and extremely important to employees under 30. So the world is changing. I'm gonna assume most of the people in this group are over 40, okay? I'm, I'm well over 40 <laughs> is the short answer. So I can't relate to everything that a 25 or 30 year old tells me, uh, but we have to. Trend number five, skill-based hiring is critically important. Let me try to define that for us. Um, somebody just popped up, Norma, what do you mean by value match? The, if the company is only striving to grow sales, increase market share or increase return to shareholders, that is not what the employees feel. They talk about, are you sustainable? Are you environmentally sensitive? Are you sensitive to diversity and inclusion? And the point is, we all know if you've got 100 employees, you've got 30, 40, 50 priority value points. The company has a couple, return to shareholder, safety, uh, compliance. So we look at the 
at the shareholder value matches. And um, here's a surprise, not everybody that works for us cares about that. Uh, back on point, skill-based hiring is valuable. In other words, don't tell me I need to have a master's degree or a BS or a, a BS in a certain function in IT is what about my capabilities? What about my year? So don't, don't judge me by my degrees. Don't judge me by my 10 or 20 years requirement to do this job. Look at what I can do. And if you have to train me, I expect you to train me and I, and I want to learn. So that's, think about our job descriptions, think about job postings and why you're not getting responses. If you put five or 10 years experience required or BS or CPA required, you're turning off candidates. Um, not from the employee's view, but a top trend is HR leadership has to be world-class. What I mean by that is if, if your office manager, your payroll coordinator is also your benefits manager and the chief people officer where the complaints and the feedback flows, it's not going to work. HR has to be director level or C level and they have to be capable. Um, next page. Thank you, Paul. Good timing. Here's a surprise. People are living longer. People are now looking at, I'm going to work 55 to 60 or 65 years. So I'm either going to have to change careers or companies frequently to, to have my values met and my satisfaction. So if that's, if that's the new reality, that the 55-year-old might have two or three more jobs by the time they retire, we have to invest in training in the middle and senior experienced employees. We might have to assume that at 55 or 60, that employee is interested in changing functions, moving skills, you know, moving experiences and, and doing something new. And that's radical thinking to, to a lot of folks with my level of gray hair. Uh, and, and employees are talking about this. Uh, back, back to the HR function away from the employees. HR needs to be upskilled. Uh, HR has to be able to talk about benefits, benefit complaints, you know, variable compensation models, working from home. HR has to step up and do this, which means they have to be trained. There might have to be resources. They might have to be paid more, uh, but they have to be able to do this for two reasons. The employees are gonna ask them, the line managers, supervisors, and executives are gonna rely on HR handling this stuff because frankly, most of us are busy doing something else and we're not as people sensitive or trained. So ups, upskilling HR is gonna be key to retaining people and recruiting people. Back to, back to the general employees, you know, data, data says you have to help me with power skills. Power skills change, and, and there's, again, go to, go to the, the full page of this, there's 10, buckets of power, power skills. You'll notice these are all what we would call soft skills. Change management, responding to change, uh, managing stress, communication, performance reviews, coaching, training, development, you know, how people respond to resiliency, you know, respond to change. And then finally, digital knowledge. A lot of employees just cannot handle the digital age we're in especially if they're working from home, working remotely, you, you, know, you can't expect everybody to have the skills that are required. I'm a great example of it. I struggle sometimes working from home and um, I don't have an IT person to uh, walk down the hall and get help on. And finally, the last of the 10 trends, no surprise here, working parents are demanding a new value proposition. And that could be part-time, it could be more, uh, more flexibility, or just an acceptance that uh, we may not work, we not, may be available every hour when you need us. And we're certainly not here to read emails at night and have Zoom calls at night and weekends. So um, those are pretty startling trends. There was almost no good news in those 10 years.
Gary, I think we got your video frozen there. Just a minute all, I think Gary's, he's got a connectivity issue. Let's we'll see if we can't get him on here in the next few seconds. <laughs> I like that, Bill. <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, Gary is rebooting. He'll be back on shortly. He has texted me and let me know. My apologies for the intermission. But he should be joining us in just a moment. If you have other questions that have come up, we can accumulate some of those and hit Gary with a bunch of questions when he comes back. Welcome back. Okay, folks, can you hear me? We got you now. Maybe leave the video off and it'll do better for the connection. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so uh, folks, I apologize for that connection. I don't know what happened. Um, so where does that take us? So those are the trends we're dealing with. Uh, so what does that mean for recruiting? So basically you start with if you go through the steps of recruiting which i'm going to do quickly is the first thing deals with it attracting and that means your postings your linkedin your social media anything you do can't just talk about what the job posting is or how great a company you are the recommendation is you have to include everything about your brand your culture your values Go back to the top 10 and what's important. You can't ignore those in your communication, social media, as important as your specific postings. Second point is you have to, uh, to recognize that um, the total rewards of, of working for your company in this position, in this company, have to be addressed. It's not just compensation. You might have to mention that it's a hybrid job. You might have to mention the, the career opportunities. So let's go to the next slide. The, 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 after the posting, so your first, your steps, your steps in, um, in recruiting personnel are, you know, an attraction ap activity where you're always managing your social media, your, your messaging, whatever that, however you can do that, you're always keeping your, the company's name out in a positive manner, positive in the view of the customer and the candidate and your current employees. Second part is, okay, now you need to hire somebody, the application phase. So you've done your posting. And now the question is, do you have a pre-application process that makes sense or is it circa 1980? where you expect people to fax it in or mail it in, wait a couple of weeks to get back to people. Um, and, and just ask, your, ask yourself a couple of questions. Does it work for your candidates? And you know, ask your candidates, ask your employees, take, take a look at it, not just HR, not just the CFO. Hey, it would work for me. This is how I found my last job. So you, and you have to ask yourself, if I was the 22 year old, and I do everything on my phone and it better be lightning fast and, and well supported and 
attractive and, and glitzy, if you will. But then ask yourself, hey, Gary just told me there's 55, 60, 65 year employees that I might want to hire. And they're not as demanding and they're not as savvy on the technology side. Um, and most of us don't think that way. Now, go to your second question in recruiting and application is do you even know where your candidates come from? And uh, again, if you look at the 50 page data, there are examples of probably 20 or 30 websites and channel opportunities of where you can even post jobs, where you can find veterans, where you can find people, frankly, with a criminal record, where you can find foreign employees, where they, where they look for that. So if your company's willing to consider somebody with a certain level of incarceration in their background, there's, there's a pool of candidates out there for you. I, I never knew that. And um, something we might have to consider. Next point is, have, have you levered your internal pipeline? Do you use the employee recommendation referral system? And, and just ask yourself, if, if, your, if your turnover is so high, are your employees going to say anything good about working for your, your company? So you almost have to stop and say, you know, are we doing it as, as well as we can? And are we listening to our current employees? Because by having employees represent us in the recruiting pipeline might be bad news. So let's go to the next step, please. So after recruiting, you know, is the interview stage. Interview stage or engagement stage starts with a phone screen. And it goes until an offer is, is made and decided. So let's, let's stop there and get out of the HR world for a second and, and ask yourself, do, do you have a process map of how your HR, your human capital management works? And, and very simply, do you even have a capital plan where, and I'll use the example, you've got a fleet of trucks, you know how many are seven years old with 400,000 miles, you know they're going to be replaced. You know when you're going to replace equipment, the roof on your building, but most people don't have a three-year capital plan that will actually tell me 25% of our employees are going to retire, likely to retire in the next three years, and flip it around. We have incredibly high turnover in inside sales or in assembly or shipping, so if we're not constantly looking for these kinds of people, we're going to be surprised when people quit or retire. The suggestion I'd make, and I make it later in the deck, is that uh, this is where finance can help HR. You know, we're analytical, we have the data. If you ask HR to put together a human capital plan, you probably won't be satisfied with the, with the plan they, they present. So the short answer is help HR. You, you know, we're analysts by trade, we have data, we can do spreadsheets, we can model it, we can graph it out and visually present it. Uh, HR may need our help. So again, your, your, your whole process map should start with a human capital plan, in my humble opinion, and proceed to go all the way from alpha to omega, which means all the way from recruiting and, and interviewing and making decisions and onboarding people efficiently and training them and giving them good feedback and constant feedback and constant training and career options. Um, you know, my guess is every one of us it's the CFO wishes we would have had this over the last 10, 20, 30 years. And we just put up with, with less than optimal situations. So let's jump back to the next slide. And a lot of this is repetitive as I drive forward, because I, again, I think this is the best practice that we gleaned from this session a couple of weeks ago. Do you even know your turnover rates and why? Do, do you look at Glassdoor? When we did this session, 90% of the CFOs in the room didn't know what Glassdoor was. And most of them were upset. They literally, they were all on the phone as we were going through the session, reading all the bad comments on Glassdoor about their company. And in some cases, they were mentioned. So that was not a good event for them. But they should have known about Glassdoor. HR should be handling that. Let's go on to the next slide, where, again, I'm asking you, if you looked at your process, of recruiting, applying, interviewing, working there, would you even interview with your own company? Honestly, ask yourself that. Ask your new employees and you get a chance to ask new employees before they decide to quit. Going back to data management, ask yourself how many people we hired in the last year are still here 
And if they're here, are they doing above average and have they been promoted or are they promotable? And just ask HR for this data of all the people we hired in 2021, give me a breakdown. How many of them lasted? How many didn't show up on day number two? How many weren't there in 30 or 60 days and why? And then how many are promotable? And I think you're gonna see in most cases, we don't have that data. So we're flying blind and oh, by the way, the world has changed and we're, and we're flying blind even for last year and the previous year. Let's jump back to the next, the next slide is now we're talking about retention. So part of the problem is we can't recruit and fill open positions. Nobody's focusing on retention. So you go back to the top 10 trends that we've tried to base this on, all about do the employee, is the employee well-being being addressed? Is the total reward there? Which means compensation's okay, but the benefits are terrible, or the benefits are great and I'll work for less salary, or I'll work for less bonus because the benefits are great. And oh, by the way, you get into the softer points. Company cares about my career. They offer training, work-life balance we hear about. And oh, by the way, my manager's a good manager, leader, and communicator. How many times people quit because of their manager? We all know that, but the, the, the data is showing I quit because my manager doesn't manage. My life is full of surprises and disappointments because of that manager. And the final one is diversity, equity, inclusion is a hot button for probably 20, 25% of the employees and we can't ignore it. And this is where HR has to be able to help the rest of the management team. Let's, let's jump into best practices. What, what can the CFO do? Again, in my humble opinion, we can help with analysis and planning. We can also look at a total spend of what does it really cost to recruit, train, retain employees. And most of us are smart enough to figure out it's not just the cost of HR. It's not just the training budget. Is Do we spend... 40, 50, 100 hours per year training our employees. So that's a cost of training. Do we understand the cost of turnover? We pay recruiting fees, advertising fees, you know, headhunter fees, and the employee, a third of them are gone in 60 days. Well, that's a waste. We're hiring the wrong people and we're paying a lot of money to do it. And we're wasting a lot of time in the 60 days. Building that comprehensive cost of staffing, recruiting, and retention is a model that we can share up on our website, but I think most of you can figure it out and get it 90% correct, but this is something we've done a best practice model on. And then finally, do, do the CFOs on the call even understand there's lots of ways to subsidize or reduce that cost by using tax credits and training funds that exist in the public space that Take, take the government's money, take our tax money and use it to train current employees and new hires. Hundred, there's probably five to $15,000 available for every new hire. It doesn't have to come out of the company's coffers. And again, we talk about how to do that. There's federal training funds, uh, 10 to $12,000 per new hire. There's WOTC credits, work opportunity tax credit, one to ten thousand dollars per new hire. So, uh, again, going hundred miles an hour and being a couple minutes over over time here, I really recommend you go to the site and and look at the forty some slide slide deck because each of these trends is is backed up with data that you can relate to that HR or your CEO can relate to. Each of these best practices and suggestions are are built out to actually give you a toolbox to work forward on that. And we're gonna provide, Gary, we'll end up providing them a link, of course, to, right. there'll be a follow-up email for everyone and you'll be able to link from that email right to some of these resources. And then of course, as Gary's uh, so generously offered, I mean, he, he will guide you to the right people to help with some of these things. Sure, so any, any chat comments while I save my voice here and, and toggle to the second half? I'm, I'm going to work on that other deck while we check on that. Okay. Um, while we're bringing up the second deck, the slides we skip at the first couple really tell you CFO solution was created by peers for peers. We all, none of us knows everything. We can't be expected to. 
but in small or private company, we, we don't have unlimited resources in our staff or our consulting budget, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why we created this. Believe me, we're not a consulting firm. I'm not selling you anything. We're, we're glad to share our knowledge. And you know what? You don't have to agree with it because we're not always right. But, you know, we're sharing awareness and we're offering introductions to, to experts like Paul and his team. And all of our experts are glad to take your call, do a Zoom meeting, and not immediately bill you because they've agreed that they support our mission of uh, sharing best practices and, and working with CFOs. In all honesty, a lot of, and I'll say this, a lot of salespeople would love to work with CFOs because we are decisive, we're analytical, we understand risk, and um, we're pretty direct. And uh, a broker, a salesman, a vendor finds out what makes us tick. And if they can help us, we're pretty good at cutting through the BS to get to that. And if we're not a good fit, that happens. They understand that they got a fair shake. If they understand our problems, a, a, good, a good partner like Paul's company, they can respond to it. So, um, you know, we're kind of direct, we're kind of blunt, we're kind of mean to deal with once in a while, but at the end of the day, we are decisive and we do sign the checks. So um, that, that's, I, I didn't plan that segue, but if you go back to our session in December, we talked about using contingency cost expense reduction people. And, and, and half, of you, half of the feedback was, I don't trust those guys, they're shysters. They promised me the world, they get into my purchasing department and I can't get rid of them and they don't deliver, but I'm stuck with them. So that is true. The bad ones are our used car salesmen and they get a hold of your data and they promise the world and you're disappointed and you're stuck with a multi-year contract that they enforce. So, you know, I don't feel that way. I, I come back to if you have a good partner, I really consider there's a time and place to use contingency cost experts. So, um, Paul, why don't you just roll up to the next slide. Um, this is summarizing our discussions at the last one. They cold call, they get into somebody, and the first thing they ask you is, give me a copy of your general ledger or your AP register, and trust me, I'll find you savings. I always kid with people that, um, tell you what, you know, to the, uh, this, is, this is like asking for naked pictures of my wife. I would never ever give you my general ledger or AP. I don't know you from anyone, but the last thing I would do as, as a vendor or as anybody in my organization or procurement is offer to give my AP register to a stranger. They could be shilling for a competitor. Who knows what they're doing with it? That's, that's private information, yet they all ask for it. Well, I'll, I'll turn it around in a different way. I think, we think, and this is not me, it's 50 CFOs that have gone through this uh, several times in the last several years, is procurement, you want you to slide up to the next slide, please, Paul. Your procurement department should really focus on what's critical to your company. And you think about it, key purchases, our, our data shows about 70% of what you spend is mission critical. If you're a, a fabricator, it's the steel, the plastic, the components you buy. It's, it's, you know, machinery you buy, maintenance supplies you buy that are mission critical for the, what you're making. Uh, if you're in the shipping business, it's obviously your containers, your trucks you, uh, that, are, that, that have to work. And we have to understand the cost of ownership, the fact that a vendor can supply on time, they can support you with tech support, et cetera. And I contend that's where your procurement department should spend virtually all their time and that you take the other 30% and you'll have to do the analysis for your company, what's strategic and what's kind of routine is focus procurement on the 70% and effectively outsource the other 30%. Maybe you wind up eliminating a buyer. I would contend you have the buyers spend time on the strategic purchases and really developing an understanding of the key suppliers, the issues, whether it's delivery, whether it's quality, whether it's tech support, whether it's getting a lower price or more value, is that that's where procurement should be focused. 
and there's a way to do vendor analyses and, and value analyses for vendors. But take 30% take of the activity off procurement and find partners or a partner to outsource it to. So um, I don't know how many people just hung up the phone or disagreed with me, but I'll, I'll contend we should be doing that. Uh, examples in my mind of where you can outsource items. Um, you know, the utilities, and these are, these are areas where you can get partners that can handle a line item or several line items. Or in our case, we've identified strategic partners that can manage a lot of this process for you and, and, and work as partners. So let's talk about what a partner is. is and I'll, I'll go back to why some of us don't like, myself included, don't like the expense reduction people that cold call you is, and we'll use an example, you're paying 11 cents per KW for per KWH for electricity, and you're in a deregulated state. And if you move from your utility contract, that's at 11 cents, they, they'll show you that I can find it for nine and a half cents, and I'm going to charge you X percent of that one and a half cent savings. Okay. What most of you don't know, because you don't see that invoice from that secondary supplier, that deregulated supplier, is number one, you don't know how good a supplier they are. But if you just look at the dollars and cents in the savings, most of you don't know that contingency expert, and I'm doing partners in air quotes, is when he saves you one and a half cents, he really got a rate of nine cents. And he pocketed the other half a cent in addition to the savings he's going to put in front of you. In other words, he saved you 15%. You should feel great about that. You should be willing to give him 40 to 50% of that for a long time. But what he didn't tell you, because he didn't show you the actual invoice from the supplier, is that he pocketed half a cent. Um, and the way they bill is he showed you one and a half cent savings. He didn't show you that, that he's getting basically getting paid on the back end by that utility company. Utility company is not obligated to tell you that because he negotiated, in my example, nine and a half cents. Extremely common in the utility telecom cell plan world where the expense reduction guy is effectively at working as a salesperson for the supplier on a back on a on getting paid on the back end is what they call it. Well, the back end, it's coming out of your back end. It's coming out of your wallet. I contend that's why they call it the back end payment. So utilities are a great example. I would suggest that if you're in a, in a state that has regulated power or natural gas, where they can't change the rate, get a subject matter expert who can look at usage and the way you actually run your factory, the, the kind of equipment you have that's burning electricity, and, and items as simple as, do you want to upgrade lighting or insulation or solar power? And, and items as simple as, why do you turn on every piece of machinery at quarter of seven every morning and set a peak that you don't hit for the next eight to 16 hours? Why don't you just put timers on? Not every fan, air conditioner, welder has to be turned on at quarter of eight in the morning while they're getting a cup of coffee. We have saved 20% by just simple timing devices on our factories. Uh, let's go to another example. We all have phones and, and data lines and cell phones for our employees. And I'm going to contend none of us understands our own home cell phone bill or cable bill, much less understanding it for the company. I'm also contend that the person who approves that invoice every month doesn't review it, doesn't know what they're paying for, doesn't care, and more importantly, uh, there, there's a lot of occasions on cell phone plans where the office manager or the receptionist or the plant manager is signing off on that bill. And part of the perk from the salesman is that that, that person is getting free cell phones for their family. So if you ever notice somebody in the in, in, that approves the invoice is carrying around four I, F, iPhone 13s and they show up every time a new iPhone model comes out, start to ask yourself, do I have the adequate controls on who's reviewing and approving invoices? Because, and I'll, I'll go to the example. 
Same thing for rental cars, airplane tickets, and hotels. I, I've worked for a lot of companies in my career. And I've found a lot of situations where the VP of sales executive assistant never, ever paid for a hotel room because the company pay, overpaid for every hotel room during the year. So uh, cover me a skeptic, cover me a non-trusting CFO, but, but I'll bet you lunch uh, that I'm, I'll be right more than I'm wrong. Now let's go back to telecom. Most of you don't know that there are incredible commissions paid to people selling you telephone service. And, the, and, and we have a video on our website by a guy named Nathan, who's an expert in this area, over 30 years of experience partnering with CFOs and owners to, to cut through the crap and deliver the truth. But if you pay $1,000 a month for your phone service or your, or your cell phone service, there's a salesman getting a 15 or 20% commission on that. If he can walk you up from $1,000 to $1,100 a month, his 20% commission goes up by five, six, 7%. So his goals are aligned to get you as high as possible and not lose your account because he's got what we call a progressive compensation model. And keep in mind, he, he has paid for that compensation on your account for as long as you're with that company. So you have phone reps that will come out and sell you a story, charge you a little bit extra, and count on keeping your account for five or 10 years. And, and our video actually shows that on a simple $1,000 a month phone bill, it's not unusual for that, that uh, rep to earn 30, 40, $50,000 in commission over the life. So when that, when that phone rep uh, comes in and brings you donuts and, and sees you every couple of years to drop off a phone upgrade, he, he is making a lot of money off something as simple as telephone and data line coverages. Let's go back to what's strategic and what isn't. Um, again, the, the whole story I'm suggesting here is do a cost stack and see where you spend your money on the other 30% and, and just literally look at a bill from 2021 and a bill from 2020 and just look at your AP register. The same reason they want the AP register. They wanna see where you're spending money. And uh, you'll be surprised what you can save on waste disposal, uniforms, janitorial supplies, any kind of service you buy. What, and this is whether you're in a restaurant, a nonprofit. We work with the Catholic diocese, you know, the greatest nonprofit in the world. They have no idea where they spend their money. And you know, we're doing the analysis for them now. They're, they're amazed at why their overhead is so high in their churches and schools and parishes. They just don't know where they spend their money, but they do it very poorly. It just makes sense for them to outsource it. But all of the categories shown on the slide, anything not strategic, I suggest you get a partner involved. We're glad to introduce you to just do the assessment. And frankly, if they can save you a dollar, they're not gonna do it. It's not worth your time. It's not worth the pay for change. It's not worth their time. So they're, they're the best at understanding where the opportunities are. And I always contend, and I've had boards push back, why are you taking the time to do this? I said, because we're gonna find that 50, 60% of the time on our non-strategic buys, we're doing okay. We've got a good vendor, good service, good technology, and we're paying fair prices, fair to great prices. It's the other 50% where we've got a terrible vendor and we're overpaying and have a terrible contract. That those. So I don't mind giving procurement a 50 or 60% B plus on those. It's the one, and, and fine, just outsource it and just continue the agreement. Um, flip it around, the, the ones where you're, you're lower quartile with a lousy vendor, nobody wants to even deal with them. So they just keep jacking up the price because you're dumb enough to keep paying it. So again, doing an audit and coming back with only 10% or 20 or 30% of items where you're you're not performing and you can save money and reduce work is a great answer. Now, if go to the next slide, if you will, please, Paul. Um, yeah, one more. One more. Doing this should not be a witch hunt of procurement or the plant manager or the executive assistant who's a approving invoices. None of them want to do that job. They don't, they just do it 
the invoice gets signed. And we can, you, I can give you a hundred examples if we had a hundred minutes, but just, just ask yourself, when somebody approves were there eight dumpster loads at $400 a piece last month out of the office, who knows how often that dumpster was emptied? Somebody just scratches it, initials it, and they don't even know that the price went up 10% over last year. And it's considered a fuel sur surcharge. Just digress for one second, an interesting fact. In Pennsylvania, trash hauling is semi-regulated, which means you can't have a fuel surcharge for more than 12 months. So, you know, we were still paying surcharges that one of my companies, as the price of diesel fuel dropped in half, they were still trying to bill a surcharge. Well, the interesting part in Pennsylvania, if you have a, a fuel surcharge, you have a 36 month window to go back and basically say, hey, Mr. Trash Collector, here's what you owe me. Now, people think it's not worth your time. I had a surcharge on my telephone service and I had an office with 66 employees. I got a check for $106,000 from my phone carrier because they had overbilled me. And from a, an audit standpoint, it was, a, it was a pattern of overbilling that was almost a RICO racketeering process. And my point was, I'm either going public or you're just gonna write me a check. And they agreed it was $106,000. Now, in all honesty, I didn't know that until one of my experts showed me that. And yeah, I was glad to pay him $30,000 to save me $76,000 and know that going forward, I had a better vendor and a better contract. So yeah, I didn't figure that out. I'm not that smart. But he, he, he explained to me that phones, trash, trash hauling are semi-regulated. And when you see an error or an outright fraudulent charge, that you can go back again in Pennsylvania, 36 months. And if, if the vendor doesn't play ball with you, you can go to our public utility commission and they bring out the hammer. So again, that's stuff that we don't know, procurement doesn't know. Going back to how to implement, basically it's not a witch hunt in procurement. It's like, we want you to focus on strategic procurement, vendor assessments, competitive bidding, in a, in a very organized and, and cross-functional manner. The other stuff we don't expect you to, to be experts in and rather than, than, than have you just push paper and spend money, we're just gonna outsource it. Let's do the assessment and see where, where it makes sense to outsource it and, and literally take it off the table and let the CFO deal with the partner. Procurement will like you more. The, the secretaries, the office manager, receptionist will be glad to get that task off their desk because they're not adding any value. They don't know what to do. They don't have the data to do their job. So again, 100 miles an hour. I apologize for that. If you, the next slide will basically say, we're on it slide now. Go to our website. You can see more detail in this. You can see a couple of videos. We've done examples. We actually have hours and hours of presentations and slide decks that get into examples. I just gave you one that happened to pertain to Pennsylvania. Uh, I know a couple of the states, but our partners know all the states. So I'm glad to refer you to introduce you to partners. They're, they're solid people and um, they're not gonna take advantage of you. So with that, um, apologize for a Zoom crash at this end, and I'll take any questions or chats. And as those come in, I thought we might reiterate a couple of things. One is, or here's a couple of things that stuck out to me, Gary, uh, yeah. from the human capital part, getting data on prior year's outcomes. And then if, if folks were to come to you with some of that data, you could probably guide them through some or give them some suggestions on what might be actionable. What do you think about that? Perfect. Perfect question. And I'll use Pennsylvania examples, and I think it's true in most states. Look at, look at last year's hires, 2021 hires across the company, and basically say how many employees were here after 60 days and not here at 90 or 120. In other words, because if you had to terminate that employee, you now own their unemployment compensation for 26 to 52 weeks. So ask yourself, and I always use this analogy, you know, how many dates did it take to find out that the person you're dating is like serially crazy? You're just not compatible. So most people would say, I'm, I, I, I know this isn't a good fit. It might be me. It might be the other person. 
Okay. So, you know, you had indications that that employee was going to be late every day of their life. Okay. But you put, you tolerated it because you needed to fill that spot on the assembly line or the shipping department. And then finally, two or three months later, you fire that person for attendance reasons, and then you own unemployment for 26 or 50 weeks. So you think about it. You wasted time with their coworkers. You brought in a lousy worker. Everybody knew it except the boss or HR or the CFO. You tolerated an incompetence. Your gut feel was right. You heard it from other employees. You ignored it. And then finally it got so bad, you had to fire that person. At that point, I start firing the managers. So if, 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 some, if you hired 10 people in shipping and five got fired at 90 or 120 or 180 days because they couldn't do the job, they didn't show up, et cetera, et cetera, that's the point that person's no longer a manager. And on a good day, they get to be a supervisor. And when I'm in a bad mood, they get to be a shipper or shown the door. That doesn't take long to drive better performance by selection and training and assessments. We had a but question that, about- That's where the data will tell you on hiring decisions, hiring failures. And then you ask yourself the next question, roll it forward 12 months from those people hired first quarter, look at them now and say, are any of them really outstanding and have been promoted? Or did we just hire an average worker that has no future with our company and shame on us? We got another question, Gary, which was, uh, will these partners, some of these cost containment partners provide a free analysis? Yeah, most of them do because they want to make sure it's worth their time. So okay. it's literally, give me a bill. Uh, I just did this for my company last week. We, 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 we changed our profile of offices. We had several offices in greater New York City. And we had some phone bills that didn't make sense. Bottom, bottom line is we had phone, phones that forwarded that, that literally each line used to cost us $50 a month. We found out through, through, the, through our, our assessment by our partner, Nathan, okay, that we used to pay $106 a month to have phone lines forward to our, to our headquarters. And we found out that price had gone from $106 to $250 a month. And that nobody saw the price increase. No, I'm sure it came through from the vendor attached to an e-invoice. And they just, they, they basically jacked up our rates 50% until we were finally figured it out. And we didn't figure out anything. Somebody, I, I sent them my bills. Three days later, I came back and said, that makes sense. We can save you a little there. We can save you a little there. And it's like, oh my God, what changed here? You got, you're getting ripped off. So literally mm -hmm. in, in less than a week, we reduced our phone bills probably 70, 80%. Um, and wow. we got the satisfaction that the rest of our spend was in place. Right. Another thing that stuck out to me in the first part was five to 15 K per new hire. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And that, and we'll make sure those resources, those resources are available on the site, right? Yes. Or if they have questions, of course, they can always ping you, but. Yeah, they're, they're, they're very hard to understand because they're federal programs administered at the state level usually, but the short story is the federal government has offices in every state that are called, usually called one-stop centers. And their job is to help you hire employees and to have unemployed or underemployed people find jobs. They have 20, a $20 billion training fund that every year there's a lot of money left in it because employers don't know how to take somebody with 80% of the skills they need and say, well, I'm gonna hire Paul, but I need to teach him SAP. He's never worked on SAP. Well, I'm not gonna hire him. And, they, and the short answer is the best practice on this whole thing is, hey, Paul, you've learned bond, you've learned you know, great planes, but you've never worked on SAP. Do you think you could learn it? Said, yeah, sure, I just have never worked with SAP. Well, it's gonna take you a lot of time. You're willing to learn it. Of course I am, I wanna work for this company. I like your mission, I like your value proposition. So it boils down to you sit down and say, Paul, you need to get to this module, you know, competency in the first 45 days. So we're gonna give you all the time you need and the training to get to there, but it's important you get there in 45 days. You keep your eye on it. You make sure that makes sense. He's comfortable. Company's comfortable. And then all of a sudden you turn to the, the state and say, we, we pay Paul $8,000 a month. He spent a quarter of his time learning SAP. And the state says, okay, we'll give you $2,000. You do it next month, you get another two or $3,000. In Pennsylvania, yeah. it's up to 10 or 12,000 bucks to, to help 
you hire somebody that's not a perfect candidate. There are no perfect candidates. So can we, uh, are there partners then that would assist with this, accessing some of this? Yes, the one-stop centers, yeah. Okay. And we've actually written out the process map. Uh, we don't have consultants or advisors per se to do that, but frankly, we've written the map out and a lot of companies have been able to implement it. And frankly, I'm glad to take a phone call because once you do it once or twice, it's actually a good practice for recruiting, onboarding, hiring, and it actually addresses some of those trends where right. does the company provide for my development and are they sincere about it? And it works because you get the line manager in the same life raft as the new hire. So you find out who your good training managers are and foremen and supervisors, and you find out who your good hires are. Tie them awesome. together, put them in a life raft. You'll see if they both survive. <laughs> awesome. All right. I don't think we have any outstanding questions. Well, um, very good. It was my pleasure. Feel free to reach me through the website. Um, we, we always provide the slide deck and access to it. So my contact information is on, on all of these uh, slide decks. And I look forward to uh, our next session. Our next session will be in one month. It's always the, uh, the third Wednesday of the month. And you'll, you'll get an email invitation through Paul's team. Yep, and we'll get everyone a follow-up email from our time together today with links to resources and uh, other things that we think could be useful. Great to share an hour with you. And Paul, thank you for sponsoring this. It's, it's great. And Norma, thank you for the thank you. Glad you could join us. Take care. Yep. Great to have you all. Have a great rest of your day.